What's up guys and welcome back to the Bonsai and YouTube channel. I'm Josh and today we're going to be giving you the complete guide to Juniper Bonsai. So stick around. Alright, so for those of you that have been around for a while on this channel, You've probably seen the original Juniper Care Guide video that we did back in 2019. That's probably how a lot of you guys found this channel and subscribed to it, so thank you guys for that. But what we're going to do today is actually remake that video. So higher quality, you know, better audio, better video, better presenting on my behalf, because when we first did that video, obviously I was new to the YouTube game, so still figuring everything out. So we're gonna remake that video and we're also gonna add some more information to it, some more updated information. So that was in 2019, quite a few years ago now. So obviously since then, I've done some more experimenting with these trees and you know learned some new things. So if I can pass that on to you guys, then all the better. So without further ado, let's jump into it. All right, so we're gonna kick this off with the number one thing that we see people do wrong with these trees, and that is not putting them outside. So if you've ever been on Facebook and you've uh, shared a photo of your juniper bonsai inside, you've probably got flamed in the comment section about having the tree outside. Now, although that is a rough way to learn about it, you know, getting flamed on Facebook or on social media, those kinds of things, what those people saying is true. So these trees do need to live outside, they need to, one, they're a temperate tree, so they need to feel the temperate environment. So they need to feel spring, they need to feel summer, they need to feel autumn, they need to feel winter. Okay, there's triggers in the trees, so the color of the UV light, the daylight length, um, the temperature outside, all these things trigger the tree to move through its growing cycles. So that's one thing that they don't get inside. They don't get those triggers so it knows when to grow in spring, when it knows to have a summer dormancy, when it knows to, you know, go through it, go from its vegetative growth into its vascular growth in autumn, and then have another dormancy period during winter. So all these things, the tree will get confused if it's inside. And then obviously the big thing is photosynthesis. So these trees actually create their sugars, um, so the glucose from photosynthesis, which is direct sunlight. So that's not behind plastic sheeting, that's not behind glass in your kitchen window, because all these things filter UV light. So what we need is just straight up outside sunlight on these trees, and that'll be the best way that you can absolutely grow them. Now, I know that in our original video that we did this, we had a ton of comments about UV lights, some people that have been growing them inside and they've survived under UV lights and all that kind of stuff. Now, I do want to point out that when we teach things in bonsai, we always teach you how to get the best results, okay? So the best results here are going to be outside. Now, there's a good chance that if you put this inside under a UV light, yes, it may survive, but is it gonna thrive? No. Are you gonna get the results that you get outside? Probably not. Now, there may be some cases where people have gotten half decent results under a UV light, but really it's my job to teach you the best way, the quickest way for you to get results out of these trees, and absolutely that's gonna be outside. Now, when we talk about putting these outside, one fear that a lot of people have is too much sunlight. You know, is the tree gonna burn? You know, is it gonna die out in that hot sun? But the, this particular species here, they can handle a lot of sunlight, as much as you can throw at them, okay? So I live in Australia. The last couple of summers haven't been so bad, but the couple of summers before that, we were constantly 40 degree heat for extended periods throughout the day. So 40 degrees Celsius, which I believe in Fahrenheit is around 109 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that. You can double check me on that. But these trees can absolutely take the sunlight. Now, when they're in full sun, what you're actually gonna get is tighter foliage, like this tree here, really tight, compact padding and foliage. When a juniper isn't getting enough sunlight, these little um, these little tufts of foliage here, they'll actually open right up. And when they open up, they, they actually start to look very, um, the tree looks 
what would you say, very messy, very open, very untidy. But when the, the little tufts of foliage are tight, okay, when they're shut because they're getting enough sunlight, then you can really build out that nice padding that you see. So 100% as much sunlight as you can get them. Now, when I say that, another thing that I want, to keep, want you to keep in mind is only give them full sun if you can keep up with the work. So when you give them full sun, obviously they're going to transpire more. Transpiring more means that you're going to have to water more. If you can't water more, then you don't want that tree transpiring more. So that's where you're going to have to change up your sunlight a little bit. So in that case, you want to give the tree as much sunlight as you can give it to the watering that you can give it, okay? So if you're somebody that works uh, long hours at work, then obviously you don't want the tree out in full sun all day um, getting that heat, transpiring light, and you're not there to water it. So what you would want to do in that case is find a position where it gets as much sunlight as you can throughout the morning when that sunlight isn't quite as intense and that heat isn't quite as intense. And then when that afternoon heat kicks in and that afternoon sun, try and put it in a position in the yard where it's in shade. So that way you've gotten at least, say, let's say six hours of sunlight in the morning. And then in the afternoon when the sun gets really harsh and the heat gets really harsh, then it's in a shaded position. Then that's going to give you the benefit of a fair bit of sunlight in the morning when it's not quite so intense and then protect it of an afternoon. And then that way you can keep up with, the, keep up with your watering. Now, another thing when it comes to sun for these uh, particular trees here, some people do actually like in the summertime to put them under a little bit of shade cloth. Now, this is a good thing to do if you want to keep real bright, vivid colors in your tree. Now, my particular trees, I haven't found that the color changes that much during the summer in intense heat, but there are other artists who have found that during the really hot summer months, if they put their junipers under a little bit of shade cloth, then they tend to keep a, a more vibrant green color in their tree. But just because the, the tree's changing a little bit of its color throughout the summertime, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's ill effects that have been had on that tree. But do keep in mind that there are other things that can change the color of the tree, like nutrient deficiencies and overwatering, all those kinds of things. So it's really up to you to learn your trees and know what you've been doing to know why the color's changing in it. But if you do find that you're getting some color loss um, from your junipers during the summer months, then maybe a little bit of shade cloth is something that you can do. Now, the next thing, and one of the most common comments that we got on the last video that we did when I told everybody that they should keep their junipers outside, a lot of people said, I have harsh winters where I am, do I still put it outside? Now, this is really gonna depend on how harsh your winter is, and there's a couple of other factors here that we'll go over too. But for the most part, we still wanna keep our junipers outside during the winter time. Now, these are a Himalayan species, so they are used to snow loads and frosts and things like that, but there are certain parameters that we need to keep an eye on, on as to how far we can actually take those down in the colder temperatures. Now, I always tell people just as a safe zone, okay, they can handle a little bit more than this, but just as a safe zone, minus six degrees Celsius is kind of where you want to have that cut off um, before you start protecting these trees. Now, as I said, they can go lower than that, but there are certain parameters that we need to look out for. So what are those parameters? Now, one of those parameters is how much work did you do the season before? So I'm talking about you've just gone into winter. So how much work did you do through summer or through autumn on this particular tree? So were you doing lots of heavy bending? Um, did you do a repot? I know some people that repot their junipers during the autumn time. Not something that I would personally recommend, but it is something that gets done. So did you repot that tree during autumn time? Um, you know, major pruning, all that kind of stuff, just work that's gonna stress this tree out. What's the overall health of the tree? You know, throughout that season, did it suffer a big pest infestation that you had to recover the tree from? Um, were there other, any other things that caused the tree to suffer ill health? Um, maybe a, a small period of drought during the summertime. 
all these things can stress the tree out and it's going to lower its tolerance to the cold during the winter time. So if your tree underwent any of that kind of stuff, then coming into winter, it is advised that you protect your juniper species. Now, something else that can affect uh, how much cold tolerance the tree can take is the size of the root ball. So smaller trees, so like these ones in the front here, they're going to be able to tolerate less cold than say this bigger one at the back here. So the smaller the root ball, the less you want to have your cold tolerance at. So, you know, let's just say for argument's sake, I'm telling you minus six is the threshold, kind of the safe zone. For these uh, smaller guys down here, I'd be saying, okay, let's look more at like minus four or minus two, something like that, just to be safe. So the smaller that root ball, the less cold tolerant your tree is going to be. The larger that root ball, the more cold tolerant your tree is going to be. Now, one other thing that I would say, and this is something that I'm just going to throw in and don't take my word for it, um, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but keeping the root ball warm is one of the main things that we want to do. When we're talking about protecting the tree from frost and cold and that, we're talking about protecting that root ball, okay? If you've got your tree in uh, more dense organic soil, which we'll talk about later, uh, later, it's my belief that that tree is going to be a lot more hardy against frost than a tree that's in inorganic soil. So like your Akadama pumices, you know, those things that are more open. Because those organic soils are going to hold a lot more heat and a lot more warmth and are going to be a lot more of an insulator than what that um, inorganic stuff is. So just keep that in mind too. What kind of um, soil you're using, how big your root ball is, and what kind of stresses that tree went through before it went into that winter period. So keep all those in mind. Now, if you do need to protect your tree during the winter time, how would we go about this? Now, depending on how harsh your winter is, if you're just getting down to say those minus six temperatures, you can do things as little as just taking the trees off the bench and putting them on the ground so that they get that warmth from the earth, okay? Something else you can go a little bit further and you can actually put uh, mulch, pine bark, that kind of stuff around the pot just as an insulator to keep that pot a little bit more warm during those winter months. If you need to go a step further, then you can go into a greenhouse. If you need to go a step further again, then you can go into something like a garage or a basement or something that's unheated. What you don't want to do is take the tree and put it inside the house where you're controlling the temperature for your comfort. So you don't want these trees getting warm, okay? You just want to protect them from the real harsh frost and things like that. So as I said, basements, garages, things like that are probably a good idea. Now, the next question you're probably going to ask there is, but if I put it in the basement or if I put it in the garage, it's not going to get any sunlight. Well, over the winter time, that's not really going to worry your juniper because it's in a dormancy state. So it's photosynthesizing very, very minutely, okay? So having it in a dark spot, in the garage, in a basement, something like that, it's really not gonna worry the tree. But what I do recommend is keep an eye on the season as we start to move back into spring. Once, as soon as your temperatures are steady back into that zone where it's gonna be safe for that tree, start moving that tree back out so it can start getting those temperate um, triggers that we talked about before. So the UV light actually changes color throughout the year. So this is something that the tree can pick up on. The daylight length um, changes and the temperature. So all these things it's gonna start getting again, you know, after the winter time, and it's gonna um, start growing again. So it's gonna go, okay, well it's spring, it's starting to warm up, now we can start to put on that growth again. So just follow those, um, tips there for winter time and you should be okay. So the next thing we're going to have a chat about is watering. Now one of the things that scares people about these trees is hearing about you can't keep them too dry or you can't keep them too wet and this kind of confuses people because you wonder well how do I not keep the tree too dry but not too wet. Now what we're actually talking about here is Junipers do like to be a little bit on the drier side of life, okay? So there are some trees out there like our Australian natives or swamp cypress that like to be, you know, really wet. And then you've got your deciduous trees. 
which move a lot of water throughout the growing season. So they need to be watered a lot more too. Whereas our conifers, they're not quite so high water mobility like that. So what we don't want to do is water too frequently. Now, when you talk about giving the tree too much water, it's not a problem of volume, it's a problem of frequency. But the thing about this problem of frequency is it usually comes from a bad soil mix, okay? So we're gonna talk a little bit about soils later, but what happens is if we use a mix that's too dense and not free draining enough in a shallow pot, what can happen is, is we actually get a water table in the pot. So down below, right below the surface near the bottom, what actually happens is that part of the soil doesn't dry out properly. So then we keep adding water to that and we keep adding water to that because the surface is drying out. And then what we end up with is essentially a swamp down here, the roots in there all rot and die and it can actually kill the tree. And like I said, that is nine times out of 10 actually a problem with the soil rather than anything else. So getting the soil mix right for these trees is something that's really important for your watering. But let's have a little bit more of a chat about the watering before we move into the soils later on and we can discuss that again. Okay, so before we move on, I just wanna clarify a little bit further about the too dry or too wet. So when we talk about too dry, we're talking about a soil system that's become bone dry, okay? And what happens there is the little root tips and the root hairs dry out and now that root's dead. So it no longer brings up water, nutrients, any of that kind of stuff. So obviously, if your whole entire root system or soil system dries out and your whole entire root system dries out, well then you're gonna end up with a dead tree. So we always need to keep some form of moisture, okay? And that's the key word here, moisture. We don't want it sopping wet, but we need moisture in the soil. So we don't want it to completely dry out. And then on the other end of the spectrum, like I just said, when you go past the point of, I would say you have dry, and then you have moist, and then you have wet, okay? So once you move up into that other end of the scale where the soil system stays too wet, that's like we spoke about before where you create like a swamp environment and then you end up with um, rotting roots. So just try to keep that in mind when you're trying to tell whether your um, soil is dry, moist, or wet. You wanna stay in that moist zone in the middle where it's not swampy, but it's not completely dry. Okay, so now that we've talked about the not too dry, not too wet um, situation, let's talk about frequency. How frequently should we water these trees? Now, this is something that's gonna change throughout the year. It's gonna change from country to country, from town to town, from tree to tree, from soils to just everything. Everything changes your water frequency. So this is something that you need to learn what's going to change your watering frequency rather than trying to set yourself a, a calendar or some kind of schedule on how to water these trees. So, you know, you may get instructions out there where people say, uh, well, these trees need to be watered once a day. But once a day might be at the start of spring, but then you move into summer and that might be, become twice a day. But then you move back into autumn and then it becomes once a day again. But then you move into winter and that might become once a week. So you can see that how the seasons, because of the you know hot and cold fluctuations, you might have a windier time of year where you are, just all these certain things will change your watering frequency. Now on top of that, you've got how much foliage mass is on the tree. So this tree here is quite dense, but if we went for a more sparse design on this, it's going to transpire less, which means it's gonna move less water. So the more foliage it's on a tree, the more it's gonna transpire. Then you've got your soils. You know, a denser soil is gonna hold moisture for longer than a more aerated soil is going to. So if you're using an organic soil, it's gonna hold moisture for a lot longer than an inorganic mix. So that's something else that's gonna affect it. If you live in a coastal area where there's a lot of wind, okay, wind dries out trees really fast. So that's gonna change your watering frequency. How healthy the tree is. So a sick tree is not gonna take up as much water as a healthy tree. So the vigor of the tree is another thing. How many roots are in the pot? What size the pot is? All these things change your watering frequency. So you need to learn those things so you can understand how to water your tree properly. But for now, until you do learn all those things and get a grasp on them, what you can actually do is just watch and react. 
okay? So every day, don't go outside with a plan already in mind to water. Go around, have a look at your trees, see which ones are drying out, see which ones are still wet, and water accordingly, accordingly to that. So, now that you got your frequency down, what about a watering technique? How do we go about watering these trees? Now, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is, do we water the soil? Do we water the foliage? Do we do both? When should we do one or the other? Now, for the most part, you're just gonna be watering your soil, okay? Because that's where the roots are, that's for what the most part takes up the water into the tree. Now, there are situations where you can water the foliage, but this is gonna be in the dead heat in the middle of summer. You're just trying to help the tree cool down. That's the only real reason that you're going to be watering your foliage. Now, you don't wanna be watering your foliage all year round, especially if you're using tap water that's high in like calcium, for example. Calcium dries out on the foliage and it actually reduces the amount that your tree can photosynthesize because that calcium's drying on that photosynthetic surface. So only water the foliage on these guys when it's absolutely necessary in the dead heat or after you've repotted, okay? Watering the foliage down is something that I like to do because it reduces that transpiration that happens and gives the root system a chance to recover and not take care of so much of the foliage. So after repotting, misting is something that I do because my trees go into a greenhouse after repotting, but if your trees are still outside and not in a greenhouse, then as you're watering the tree, you can give the foliage a bit of a water. If you can, water the foliage with collected water rather than town water because of the reasons that I just stated about the calcium and stuff drying out on the foliage. Now, the other thing that you want to understand is if you are watering the foliage, once again, only in the dead heat in the middle of summer. Now, you're not going to burn the foliage by putting water on it. That's been disproved. But you don't want to be doing it late in the afternoon and into the night because that water is just going to sit in there all night and it's not going to evaporate. And then you can actually cause some fungal problems in your tree. So just try and keep that in mind when you're doing that. Now, when we think about watering, we think it's quite an easy thing to do. We just come along, we put some water on top of the tree and walk away. But really there's some considerations that we need to take. And this is with all your bonsai trees, not just your junipers. But let's have a quick chat about that. So when we're watering these trees, we wanna come along and we wanna give a few passes of the hose across the top of the soil surface until it's essentially flooded. What we wanna do is watch that flooding and make sure it moves through the pot. Once it moves through the pot, we need to repeat, repeat that process about two or three times. Might be three or four times, just depending on the size of the pot and the density of the soil and all that kind of stuff. But what you essentially want to look for is the water coming out the bottom of the pot like a tap. So it really needs to be draining out of there. So the reason that we need to do that is because if we think about this root system that we have here, a lot of the times the water that we put on the surface, we put on the sides, around the back, around the front, that's where the flooding is, but directly under the trunk, there's no water that's going directly into that part of the root system. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that this whole entire pot is full of water, because once that's full of water, then what will happen is the section in the middle in here that's dry, it will actually pull moisture up into that section through capillary action, okay? It's like if you've got like a paper towel or a towel of some sort and you put it in a, a jar of water and you see that water move up. That's capillary action. So we need to make sure that the center of the root ball also gets water. But the only way that's gonna get water is if the rest of the root ball is completely soaked and there's enough moisture there that can actually get pulled up into that center section. So we want to make sure that we give consideration to how much water we're putting in the pot. As I said before, overwatering isn't about how much water is going into the pot. It's more about how much water is staying in the pot. So we want to keep watering and watering and watering until we know that that root ball is absolutely completely soaked. Now, another tip that I can give you is using an actual watering wand that's made for bonsai. Now, some people think that these are just a gimmick to make money and all that kind of stuff, but what they actually do, especially when people are using organic soils, is they prevent the compaction of the top of the soil. So if you use just a regular hose, the water droplets in that are quite large. And 
when they hit the surface of the soil, they actually compact it. And then that compacting can prevent the percolation of the water throughout the soil system. So if we use a softer wand, then we prevent that compaction happening over time. The other thing that those soft wands do is prevent you from washing off your fertilizer and washing off your top dressing and all that other um, kind of stuff. So I'll leave um, links down in the description below if you want to check some of those wands out because they really will help you with your watering. So now we're going to have a little bit of a chat about soils. Now for some people this can be a bit of a touchy subject, but what I'm going to do is talk about what would probably be the best practice and then we'll come back on that and talk about what you can do if you can't follow that best practice. So when we talk about soils, we've got two types that we would use, organic and inorganic. Your organic soils would consist of just like your regular garden mixes, which are very loamy, sandy, those kinds of things. They've got like peat and pine bark and all that kind of stuff in them. And then you've got your inorganic substrates, which are your acadamas, pumices, lava rocks, things like that. So generally what I do is when a tree's in development, so this is really any bonsai tree, but with your, your junipers, when you're developing the tree, so you're trying to grow it, okay? You're trying to get that big trunk, you're trying to get those first branches established, you're trying to get the structure and the bones of the tree established. That's when we're in a black plastic nursery pot and we use organic soils. Now the reason that we use these organic soils is they hold a ton of nutrients, they're very dense, they hold a lot of heat, they grow root systems really quickly, and this is all the stuff that we want in development. Once we move into refinement, then we're looking at growing the fine branching, the small foliage, all that kind of stuff on top of that big thick structure that we've made. So we've got that balance um, of the thick structure and the fine ramified branching. Now to achieve that fine ramified branching, we use the inorganic soils because not only does it help us grow those smaller branches and foliage, it slows the tree down, but the other benefits that we do have of those inorganic soils is one, they drain far better in the smaller bonsai pot than the dense organic soils do. They hold less nutrients, which allows us to control our fertilizing a little bit further. They also grow a finer root system. Now this is really important in a bonsai pot because we've got limited space. So we need to make that limited space as efficient as possible. And the more smaller roots that we have in that bonsai pot, the more surface area we have of roots. So the higher surface area of roots that we have, we have more ability to take up water and nutrients and fight pests and disease and those kinds of things. So those are the reasons that for me, in development, I use organic soils. In refinement, so in a bonsai pot, I then move over to the inorganic soils. Now, there are a lot of people out there that push back on the inorganic soils because I understand they are expensive, and two, there is nothing to fall back on. So, if the with your inorganic soils, they dry out really fast, so you need to be available to water them. So, not only are they expensive, but you've got no safety net. So I do understand. So if you do need to use organic soils in a bonsai pot, I do recommend breaking it up with something like perlite. So perlite is something else that you can get really cheap. So mix that in with your organic substrates. And then you just have to adjust your mindset for how you water the tree, how you fertilize the tree. So the tree's not gonna die if you use those organic soils, but it's just gonna make your journey a little bit more difficult, let's just say. So that's how I look at soils for juniper bonsai and you may look at them the same way I do or you may look at them differently but either way give it a go and see how you go. Now let's have a little bit of a chat about pruning for your juniper bonsai. So something that I do a lot for my junipers is actually allow them to grow free in spring. So you can see that this one that I've got here the pads are neatly trimmed up, but coming into the spring period, what I'll allow it to do is just flush and grow. So what this does is if you think about the energy levels of the tree, if your juniper is starting here in spring, it's going to expend a little bit of that energy, okay, to put out more foliage mass. It's going to expand its foliage mass. Now, what you don't wanna do is cut off that expansion as it's put its energy out, because what you're going to do is leave the tree in a deficit. 
what you want to do is leave that expansion of foliage on so what it can actually do is put energy back into the tree and hopefully with that expanded foliage mass you will actually end up with more energy in the tree than you started with in spring if you cut that foliage off you're going to end up with less energy if you leave that foliage on let it photosynthesize give back to the tree now you're going to be energy positive so now the tree is going to respond better to any of the work that you do so for me as i said coming into spring i allow the tree to flush and then after the tree hardens off photosynthesize gives back to the tree then i come back in and clean it up and this is generally you know late spring early summer so the next lot of pruning that i'll do on my juniper bonsai like I said, will actually be late spring, early summer. Now what I'm doing is coming in and all that new foliage that's coming on the tree, these trees are gonna end up quite bushy, quite shrubby, that's how they grow. So what we're gonna to wanna to do is come back in and we're gonna to wanna to clean up all the interiors, we're gonna clean up that crutch growth, okay, we're gonna clean up anything that's on the undersides, get rid of that stuff that we don't need. And what we also wanna do is we wanna open the tree back up. We wanna allow that sunlight to get back into the interior of the tree. We want to let that airflow come in through the tree and just really open it back up. Even if you've got a, a quite full canopy design on your tree, you still want to open up those spaces and let that air and light come through. Now, one of the benefits of this is, is we know that with our trees, each year they grow and grow and grow. Everything expands. So we always want to make sure, even though that we're cleaning up that interior and we're getting rid of those crutch growth and all that kind of stuff, we want to make sure that we are still allowing buds to grow on the interior of the tree because eventually those buds are going to have to replace what's out here. So you can imagine these branches, they get longer and longer every year. We don't want the tree to get longer and longer. But what we need is some buds further back in. So as this comes out, those other buds come back in and replace so as that grows out then this comes in and we keep replacing but if we don't allow that light and air into the interior of the tree we're never going to have those buds that are going to grow in there so eventually what's going to happen is the tree's going to get really leggy those branches are just going to get longer and longer and longer your foliage is going to get further away from the tree and you're not going to have any buds further up that branch to actually come down and replace this that's getting further away so make sure that you open it up to the air and the light now, depending on your growing season, after you've opened the tree up in the summer, you may get another flush of growth during the autumn period, and then you're going to want to do the same work again. You're going to want to let it flush, harden off, give back to the tree, and then as you move into the winter time, you're going to want to open that tree back up to the air and the light again, because as we move through winter, we've got a damp period, we don't see much of that moisture moving away from the tree, so we really want to get as much air and light in there as possible to keep that moisture under control. We don't want that tree rotting out or getting fun fungal infections or anything like that. So if we go over that period again, spring, let the tree grow, late spring, early summer, clean the tree out, open it back up to the air and light, try and get those buds growing back into the center again. In the autumn, once we have another flush, let it come out, harden off, give back to the tree, and then moving into winter, we want to open the tree back up again, clean it all back out, let that air and light in so that we don't end up with fungal or rotting inside the tree. So now that we've discussed the timing of pruning for these trees, how do we actually prune them? Now, one thing that you don't want to do is just come along and basically hedge prune these. So come along and just snip over the top of the foliage and basically shape them like a hedge. Um, because what you're going to do there is you're actually going to cut through the foliage and the foliage is going to die back and go brown. And that's not what you want to do. You actually want to get in with proper bonsai scissors. Now bonsai scissors are made with finer blades to get in there. And you want to get in between the needles and actually cut into the shaft of the branch or on the, uh, where the foliage is. You don't want to cut through the foliage itself. You always want to cut through that shaft to prevent that browning off of the tree. Now if you do uh, cut through the foliage and it browns off, you're not necessarily going to kill the tree, but you are going to get some dieback and how far that dieback goes, you're not going to really be able to control. So if you want to cut the tree back properly, then you really want to do that. If you want to learn about how to actually create pads properly on these and develop the branches and all that kind of stuff, we do have other videos on that subject matter, so go through our channel and go back and check them out. Okay, so the fun part. 
wiring our juniper bonsai. Now, we're not going to get into the nitty and gritty here of, you know, how to wire clockwise, anti-clockwise, what gauges to use, all that kind of stuff. You can get all that over on our course on the Bonsai Dojo. But what we're going to talk about today with these junipers is more when to wire. So for me, personally, lots of people do different things. That's just bonsai as a whole. Everybody has their different techniques. But for me, just like our pruning, once we come into spring, I leave the tree because the tree's growing, okay? That's the fastest time that it's gonna grow and it's swelling. So if we put wire on there, we're gonna get wire bite. Now, wire bite on juniper species is not something that I worry about at all, even if it's really deep, because these trees, they callus up, they swell really well, and then they bark over and you don't even see that that wire bite was there. But still, I like to try and avoid it where I can. If you put wire on a juniper, in our environment anyway, at the start of spring, you're gonna be taking it off four weeks later anyway. So there's really no point. So much like the pruning, I just let the tree grow during the spring period. Now, as we move into summer, I generally do a little bit of wiring, okay? So this will be out on the branch tips or whatever where I've pruned, I'm making some adjustments, just doing some little things here and there. I don't do a whole lot of wiring on the tree during the summertime. But as we move into the autumn period, this is where I do the bulk of my wiring. So during the autumn time, we can get away with a lot more of those bigger bends. We've got less stresses on the tree, okay? The tree's starting to slow down, so it's not gonna swell so much, but we are still getting some active growth, so that wiring is going to set. So autumn time for me is the absolute best time to wire these trees, because of all those reasons that we just said there. Winter time, I don't even bother because you put the wire on in winter, it's not gonna set as well because the tree's not physically growing, those fibers aren't gonna set. And then after that, you've got spring, so it's gonna grow really quickly, you're gonna have to take that wire off anyway. So generally, that's how, or that's when at least I wire my junipers anyway. So just to recap, in spring, nothing, unless I really, really have to. Coming into summer, just some small moves on the tips of the branches just to fix up where I've done some of that pruning or maybe move a little bit of a branch here or there. And then autumn time is where I do my real big bends, okay, and really wire the tree out because we still have some active growth, so those fibers are gonna set and we don't have such big stresses on the tree such as extreme heat or extreme cold, anything like that. Now, the other thing that we can talk about in this section is whether we use aluminium wire or copper wire. Now really, this is gonna come down to you, but aluminium wire is always cheaper. It's easier for beginners to handle. The copper wire is gonna be more expensive, but the benefits that you're gonna have of copper wire is it's gonna hold better, especially with conifers. Conifers do like to fight back a bit, especially when you're doing big bends, you're really gonna need that copper wire for that extra strength. Copper wire is a lot more incognito as well. So once you put copper wire on a tree, it stands out less than the anodized copper wire, uh, anodized aluminium wire does. So that's kind of another benefit of that. So at the end of the day, it's really not gonna matter one way or another. It's gonna be up to you how much you wanna spend and how much those things really matter to you. If you are doing big bends, you probably are going to need to use that copper wire. But another benefit of the copper wire is you can actually use a smaller gauge but get the same strength that you would out of a larger gauge um, aluminium wire. We do have articles on our website that talk about that so you can go and check that out if you want to. But that's just, you know, copper wire, aluminium wire, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, but I'll leave that up to you. Fertilization for these trees. Now junipers aren't quite so picky when it comes to fertilizer, let's just say. Unlike some of our you know, deciduous um, species where we can really ruin the design if we get the fertilizing wrong, most of the time with our juniper species we can get away with just uh, uh, like a neutral fertilizer, something that we're not putting too much thought into, which is really good for beginners. So we do need to separate our fertilizer though into two sections. So we've got our development and our refinement. Now, like we spoke about before in development, we're really just trying to grow the tree, get it nice and big, thick, strong, all that kind of stuff. So in this situation, I usually either just use a really strong slow release, it's very high in nitrogen, 
or a chemical fertilizer, something like a, like a liquid, even though a slow release is chemical, but when I'm talking about that, I'm talking more like a liquid fertilizer, okay? But once we move into refinement, now we're trying to control the fertilizer a little bit more. We don't want the tree getting out of control. We just want to maintain. We want to maintain the health. We want to maintain the color. And we want to just maintain the overall health of the tree. We don't really want to be pushing big amounts of growth. So this is where I would change over to something like an organic because most of our organic fertilizers are quite low in nitrogen. And the other benefit that they do is they create a healthy soil system as the organic fertilizer breaks down. And this is something that the chemicals don't do. So once we move into refinement, now we're looking to use something that's not as strong and we're just looking to maintain. So that's probably the simplest way that I can put it for you. Now, if you want to learn anything more in depth that we're talking about in today's video, you can head over to our Bonsai Beginners course over at the Bonsai Dojo. I will leave a link down in the description below for that as well. But we do go more in depth to all this stuff that we're talking about today, like soils and fertilizers, pruning, and this is for all species of trees. But just for this video, as a basic bit of knowledge, in development, we can use our slow releases and our liquids, and we can use something that's high in nitrogen just to pump that growth and really get that tree growing. But once we move over into a bonsai pot, into refinement, now we're looking to refine more into maintenance mode. We're looking to keep the color in the tree, keep the tree healthy. We don't want to blow out the proportions. So now we come down to a lighter organic, which is also going to help a healthy soil system. All right, so different types of junipers. Now, when we're talking about junipers, we're going to come across two main types, which we've got here. Now, this one here, which you've seen through most of this video, there are different names for this around the world. So some people call them green mound junipers. Some people call them nana. I mean, they may even be different things in the United States. I don't know because we're not there. Here in Australia, we call them squamata, but some people say that these aren't a true squamata. So there's always those arguments of what they're called. But these are pretty much the most common juniper that you're going to see no matter what they're called. Now, these ones here are your shimpaku juniper. Now, you do have some different uh, foliage types like kishu and itoigawa and things like that. Um, but these are really the two main ones that you're going to see. Now, this one here, this will grow a lot quicker. You're going to get a bonsai a lot faster with this type of juniper than this one. But this one here does tend to look quite a lot better once you end up with a more refined tree. You've got those softer foliage pads. Um, they just turn out a whole lot nicer. But as I said, these guys do grow painfully slow. So, you know, this one here, I've been absolutely pumping it in development for the last, like, five years or so, and it's only ever so slightly thickening up. So you can see at the moment that I keep it really, really bushy, trying to keep as much foliage on this tree as humanly possible to give it everything that I can. And we are developing the branches at the moment as well on this. Where this one, you can keep it a little bit more sparse if you want to, but you can see that I do still keep this one while it's developing as full and as thick as possible. But these are the two main types that you are going to see. Now, there are a lot of different junipers out there, so do your research on them. Some, um, some lend themselves more to bonsai than others, like these two do. These are why these two are the most popular ones, because you can get that padding um, a lot better on these. The, the foliage doesn't seem to droop or elongate quite so much. It does become really compact and tight. So just check out some of the junipers that are out there, some like the blue rug juniper, stuff like that. I know that they have a lot in America, a lot of the different ones that they collect. So I just wanted to point that out because I know in the last juniper video I did, I didn't actually show the shimpaku at all. So most of the stuff that we're talking about will work between the two of them. They do have a slightly different growth pattern. So these ones here tend to elong uh, elongate and then they compact at the back of the uh, elongation, where these ones tend to ball up and compact first and then they get the elongation from there. But really that's the only two difference between them. I mean, besides the obvious fact that they've got very different um, foliage, but I'm talking in terms of like fertilizing, watering, pruning, sunlight, all that kind of stuff. 
They are very similar species. All right, so that concludes this video. I hope this one's been as helpful, if not more helpful than the last one that we filmed. So go out there, give these techniques a try. See if you can get your junipers nice and healthy and thriving with this information. The other thing you can do, if you want to learn more in depth, you can go to www.thebonsaidojo.com and sign up for one of our courses over there. I'll leave some links down in the description below to some helpful articles, the dojo, and also our online bonsai shop. But until next time, enjoy your bonsai journey.